I know this is all speculation, but I mean, based on the trends and, you know, you had an article that you published on Truth Out, like the last day of 2020, uh, just sort of going over like the um, increase of far right violence in the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, with I mean, again, it's so hard to to truly and accurately know what's going to happen. But I mean, what do you how does the based on what's happening now and on previous tre- the trends that you have observed over the years, what can you kind of anticipate they'll how do you think they're going to react uh, under a Biden administration, for instance, and with their favorite president leaving office? Um, you know, I, I my my sense is that they're going to engage in more acts of one-off terrorist events, almost, or or things like that. Um, I, I'm just curious, like based on your understanding of the far right and the behavior of those on the far right, like what can we expect uh, with that? I think all the monitors are expecting a wave of, of terrorism or other, you know, close to it actions by people on the far right, by disenchanted Trumpists, um, mm. because they no longer have a political, they no longer can use mainstream politics as a vehicle. So they're going to use, you know, extra parliamentary tactics. Um, and they believe, you know, the belief that the election is stolen is really going to fuel these things because um, mm-hmm. they truly believe it. Like this is, the thing, everyone at that demonstration in D.C. believed the election was stolen. They all just believe a fabrication with no evidence, right? And that's a very dangerous situation. Um, right. Obviously, the far right people are going to go into some of it's going to depend on if these independent Trumpists can keep a political, you know, stream together and Trump's um, role in this. The militias, they're also obviously going to move in an anti-Biden stance i mean the left has done well the last four years in an anti-trump stance so you can organizing against another political faction is often you know useful or it's not always the best but sometimes it's very good Mm -hmm. um the militias are probably in the best position to take advantage of this historically they've um kind of gone down under republican administrations but they've been able to hitch their you know hitch their trailer to the other groups that supported Trump and they're generally anti-federal government and they've downplayed this or really kind of dropped this under the Trump administration, but they'll be able to, and those are their core talking points, political talking points. They'll be able to bring them back up to the fore under Biden. Mm -hmm. So I think they're going to be the group that is most likely to benefit from this. I don't think the proud boys are going to do very well. I think people are going to be like, you had your, your moment and we're done with the violence, Mm -hmm. you know, just a general deflation of Trump. Um, and the others will see what they do. I mean, you know, I hope the QAnon stuff just goes away. It may linger on as a conspiracy theory and get into conspiracy circles. It's sort of a conglomeration of past conspiracy theories, though. Mm-hmm. All this stuff about secret pedophiles and Satanists and stuff. These are long standing right wing conspiracy theories, you know. Right. So QAnon acts as like a, a bowl to put all kinds of existing currents in it. Right, right. So we'll see. Those are the things that I can pick out the most, you know, coming up. I think a lot of people who enter the fascist movement, and this is an interesting thing. Over the last four years, it's the first time in the U.S. we've seen a fascist movement, a big one, uh, you know, a revival of it that's not explicitly neo-Nazi. Like Mm. there's some Nazi elements, but it's much more undifferentiated. Like, you know, people like Richard Spencer, he's not a neo-Nazi. He's a, but he's a fascist, you know. We haven't seen this sort of, this kind of thing lately, but they'll create a new generation of, of fascist activists that will continue for a few years. Like those kinds of things tend to have ups and downs. And when they have ups, it sort of revives the, the core activists with the new generation and makes them younger. So the, the other ones don't age out, Hmm. you know, so it doesn't age out altogether. Right. Could you elaborate on that point a little more about how Richard Spencer is not a neo-Nazi, but is a fascist? I mean, I understand there's probably distinction. There is distinctions between these two things, but I, I am curious, like, what are the distinctions? Like, you're saying a real fascist movement has really emerged in the United States, but it isn't explicitly, like, a neo-Nazi uh, ideology. I like, So could you explain that a bit and differentiate the two? Well, I mean, people already know this if you think about it. Mussolini was a fascist, but he wasn't a Nazi. You know, mm. Nazism and neo-Nazism are one kind of fascism. Um, 
so if we're talking about the actual fascist movement, not someone who may act like a fascist like Trump or something, but, you know, it's a coherent movement. It's existed since some people argue since the late 1800s, um, certainly since the 19 late 19 teens, uh, mm. um, early 20s is when Mussolini came to power. Um, so, I mean, neo-Nazis act in a specific way, have a specific discourse, often look a certain way. And, and Richard Spencer's not part of that. Neo-Nazis criticize Richard Spencer, and most of them don't like him. Mm. Um, Spencer is much more like a traditional white nationalist. And there has long been longstanding tensions between neo-Nazis and white na- other white nationalists. I mean, I consider neo-Nazis one kind of white nationalist in the United States. Um but, mm. you know, there, there's a lot of tension between the different factions. So a lot of them don't like the neo-Nazis. Nazism produces this reaction from people that all white nationalism doesn't. You know, the Jewish community in particular is much more incensed about specifically about Nazis. Not that in general they like white supremacists overall. Right. But Nazism is a particular – it's particularly homophobic, is particularly, you know, anti-feminist, is particularly – anti-semitic and is particularly genocidal whereas other kinds of white nationalism may be like oh well we just want second class citizenship or you know Mm -hmm. for non-white people or you know other i mean more milder forms of what their goal is and what their rhetoric is and tend to shy away from you know endorsing genocide and things like that sure there may not be a big difference in the end to most people um who are outsiders, but you know, it's like we wouldn't, people on the left would never group together anarchists and, you know, Trotskyists and uh, third world Marxists who are entryists into a, a popular organizing group, right? We would see the distinctions. So sure. the, the far right and white nationalists have those same distinctions too, even though it might be a matter of, of subtlety and, you know, public facing. And at the end of the day, they may all be kind of have the same issues that they're pushing because there's only so many issues you can get traction with right right okay well that makes sense thank you for for elaborating on that and uh my next question is you know one of the big things that happened in the wake of this uh capitol hill siege coup attempt do you do you see this as a real coup maybe i'll ask you that do you see this as an actual coup attempt or something else no absolutely not if it was a coup attempt uh, trump had his moment to declare himself dictator that was his moment oh and he didn't Okay. I don't believe I don't believe that the people involved, I mean, some like a small minority may have uh, knew what they were doing. They clearly didn't have a plan. Right. I mean, you know, maybe a small group of them did have a plan. Maybe they had insiders to guide them and stuff. But it was clearly a very small group. The mass of the crowd, it was probably, frankly, a crime of opportunity. Hmm. You know, they were like angry. They marched there. They're like, oh, we could take these tiny group of police officers you know but a lot of them people went inside and they were taking selfies and milling around and there was you know footage of people leaving people are streaming in and out and people leaving being like nothing in there there's nothing to do so i don't understand why that's a coup i mean hmm. which part of that is a coup i mean a, a, you know if it was a real coup trump would have taken power they would have set up a revolutionary council to announce that the Congress was disband. They hereby disband the Congress or whatever, whether they have the actual power to or not. I just think it's a crime of opportunity, you know, and I, the left would do the same thing. Let's just be really honest. If they thought they could storm the Capitol at some big demonstration with thousands of people, I'm sure they would. Mm. Right. I guess the goals would be a little different. I would the goals would be a little different. It'd be a lot more organized. <laughs> people would set up a press office. They'd be handing out free sandwiches, you know, <laughs> There'd be a chill out room and, you know, there'd be more street medics, you know, probably all these people wouldn't have died of heart attacks because there would have been street medics. I mean, that's a clear, clear difference. And uh, no, no free food. That's the other big difference. Right. That was one of the funnier takes I saw after this where people were, you know, saying it was Antifa that was responsible for the violence. And it's like, you don't know, like we Antifa would be far more better organized, just like you said, like they would like they know how to protest. So, you know, it would be far. <laughs> if it was the Antifa, there would be no live streamers and everyone would be wearing masks. Exactly. Right? I mean, rather than these, these this is as a coup attempt, they're live streaming what they're they're committing federal crimes and live streaming it. That doesn't seem like very together to me. Right. Yeah, for sure. It, it just speak. It just sort of 
kind of reeks of entitlement, you know, like, I don't know how people could not think that there wouldn't be consequences. And in, in many ways, I, I, I understand it. I mean, um, obviously, if you're a leftist and you're protesting, you're going to receive a lot more hate and, and violence from the police. Um, so I think leftists that are organizing in the streets understand this a lot more. And it seems like the far right doesn't seem to have that same kind of uh, understanding of the situation. Like it doesn't, it doesn't well, occur with them as much where they have police yeah. attacking them. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that they don't. It makes sense that they don't because it doesn't happen to them. Why should they expect it to happen to them? Right. You know? Right. So, and I think they, because they live, you know, the, the people at this demonstration in particular, because they are all conspiracy theorists or believed in conspiracy theories, like really just don't understand like what it means. I think they, you know, they're like, I, they really believe that they were entitled to come into, in this sense, into and evade the Capitol because it was their house or whatever. And I think they really just weren't here enough to understand that well, how this was going to play with the rest of the country. And that, you know, while local police may ignore certain things that you do, especially if they don't like your target as well, like that, that they're not going to ignore federal crimes. Mm hmm. I just don't think these things dawned on them. 